This is the voice of Motown Podcast. I'm Tyler Pepe. And I'm Brandon Cork, and this is the WVU Sports Podcast by two suffering WVU fans. All right, please subscribe to our page on YouTube. It's the voice of Motown Podcast. Share your thoughts on today's episode in the comment section. Tonight, we are going to discuss the blue and gold spring game, transfers Jesse Edwards, and potentially Raekwon Battle. Also, some new NCAA football rules. And to help us do all of this is the voice of Morgantown's own Clark Johnson. Clark, thanks for joining us, man. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, excited to chop up some of this uh, stuff that we saw over the weekend with you. Um, You know, a lot of digest, I feel like it. Oh, yeah, a lot of headaches to come. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, you guys may have read some of Clark's articles on the voice of Morgantown's page. Um, Just look to see who's writing them. Sometimes you'll see his name popping up there. But this is the first time we've had him on the podcast, so we're excited. And let's dive right into it. West Virginia's gold and blue game didn't have the best weather, but it did provide a lot of scoring. Scrimmage games don't follow football's traditional scoring system. However, the game ended with a 56-51 to 51 gold team victory, and that's a lot of points even for a scrimmage game. Um, Brandon and I always say don't put too much stock into a spring football game. But luckily for us fans, the scrimmage did give us a lot of fun topics to discuss. So let's dive into them. Uh, We'll start with the quarterbacks. True freshman Sean Boyle did make a late appearance, but uh, all the talk has been about Garrett Green's and Nico Marshall's performance. Green completed 8 of 11 for 156 yards and a touchdown. He also had 16 rushing yards. But keep in mind, the defense wasn't allowed to tackle the quarterback in a scrimmage. Um, but the highlight for Green, he caught a 40-yard touchdown from Preston Fox on a fun Philly special type of trick play. Um, overall, an excellent game. It's hard to find a lot of things to complain about his performance. However, Nico, he only completed 6 of 12 for 58 yards, and he had negative 19 rushing yards. Um, the day clearly belonged to Garrett, but uh, do you guys put a lot of stock into a spring game? I mean... Brandon, do you think the competition's over? It seems a little early to call it already. No, but I, I definitely think there's some huge hurdles for, for Nico to overcome. And, you know, the big issue that I saw wasn't necessarily his arm or the throws that he was trying to make. I think he was okay there. But my biggest concern with him was his pocket presence and awareness. And the one thing that stood out to me last year during the spring game when he played was just that. He was tremendous in the pocket. He moved around well, and he even did it um, whenever he played against um, whoever our crapper of a team that we played last year was. Um, He came in at garbage time. I mean, I felt like pocket presence and awareness and decision-making in those situations was one of his strengths coming into this season. Um, Unfortunately, it seemed like he regressed tremendously there. And um, we all know how sometimes our offensive line can look great and other times it can seem like it's just as a sieve. Um, I know we're bringing back a lot of guys, but he's going to have to be able to navigate those situations more effectively because that's something that really held JT Daniels back and Jarrett Deggy and all of them. Um, so right now I have a lot more confidence in Garrett Green. Um, my mind could change if we get a lot of reports and, you know, truth around um Garrett seeing some improvements but right now I would really want to see Garrett Green as the quarterback come September yeah Clark how do you feel about the situation do you think the competition's still wide open I don't it's not wide open anymore I mean I think it'll go on until probably a week or two before the first game but I mean anybody who was watching that game could clearly see Garrett Green is the guy for this team right now I mean I I don't know it's it's hard to Hard to really gauge a spring game because, I mean, like you said, they can't really – they can't even touch the quarterbacks. So how many of those sacks that Nico took would he have been able to scramble out of and make a play out of? Who knows? But, I mean, Green, he's he, he has leaders, he's good leadership skills. He's quick. He, he has a rocket arm. Like, I don't know if you guys saw some of those passes on Saturday, but they were bullets. Like, he fired that thing in there. He was accurate, made good decisions, scrambled when he had to. I mean, and he's been around the program for three, going on three, four years now. I mean, it's it's his turn. That's that's my thing. It's his turn. I think he's earned 
the right to be the starting quarterback, especially, I mean, he beat Oklahoma for us last year. I mean, let's be real. I mean, without him, we wouldn't have won that game. And that was the first time we beat him since we joined the Big 12. Take him out of the equation, you know, we're, what, 10-game losing streak to him. I mean, the guy has earned the job, and I just hate seeing Neil Brown bury him every single press conference. And I think that's the most frustrating thing about this is Neil is showing, like, it's like he's showing no confidence in him when everyone else outside the program's like, uh, it's kind of obvious he's he's the best option right now. But, I mean, as far as the competition, I mean, there'll be coaching talk, but Neil's got it. He has to start Garrett Green game one. Has to. Yeah, I mean, there's still, what, eight eight months, something like that. Uh, no, not eight months. What am I talking about? There's still, like, five months left until the first game. And so – uh, a lot could change. I mean, we could see improvements over the summer, but um, I, like I said at the top, I don't put a ton of stock into these scrimmage games just because we talked about this a few weeks ago. If you watched last year's scrimmage game, it looked like Will Crowder was the best out of all of our quarterbacks, and we saw him get the least amount of playing time out of all of them when it came to actual gameplay. But I am impressed with Garrett. I, I would be perfectly fine if they did start him. I even felt that way last year. I wanted him to get more of an opportunity before he did. Um, he has put his time in. And you kind of mentioned it. Without a doubt, he is a gunslinger. He, he's he's almost Brett Favre-like. He's, he's going to throw some boneheaded plays. But at the same time, that's going to lead to some big plays, too, that could really break open a game. And... Uh, we saw it when he got his starts last year. He's very gutsy. He's going to take off. He's going to welcome contact. So um, I, I hope we go into next season with two healthy and capable quarterbacks because both guys like to run. And when's the last time WVU had a running quarterback who didn't have to deal with some type of injury at one point during the season? So I feel like if uh, if this team's going to a bowl game, we're going to need both guys ready to go no matter who starts but um I do like that you brought up the fact that Neil Brown seemed to once again just be very um uh, reluctant to give Garrett Green a lot of compliments which um is still head scratching to me at this point I, I feel like we can't just say it's a coincidence he's done it for what three years now going on three years now and uh I don't know what are your thoughts on that Brandon no that that's one thing uh, kind of you know, before I answer that, the one thing that um, may lead into my answer uh, anyways is, you know, the system that Neil Brown runs or whoever the offensive coordinator has been has always kind of had elements of, you know, you have some RPO in there, you have some read option in there. And despite that, it seems like, you know, the desire has always been to have someone who's more pocket friendly. And I know Nico is is mobile, but he is nowhere near as athletic as Garrett Green. Um, he is someone who definitely seems to like to prefer to stay in the pocket. Um, and for these past three years, um, we've had Garrett Green and we've had opportunities to put him into the system that I feel like would fit him pretty well, giving you know the type of plays that we want to use. So kind of leading into your question, it just kind of baffles me why still to this day, um, there's so much reluctance around Garrett Green and praising him and encouraging him and making him feel like he's the guy. I understand he doesn't have the stars next to his name. I understand that he didn't have the hype coming in that other guys have. But in terms of fit, I feel like he fits what this offense wants to do. And if you want to mitigate, um, mitigate your risks with him in terms of, you know, limiting turnovers or turnover um, worthy plays, you know, you can build the system in a way that could limit that, that system, you know, have him run the ball more, have him run more short routes. Don't, you know, run a lot of deep routes for him or whatever it might be. Um, but you know that that's coaching. Um, I feel like a good coach would see what Neil Bur or what Garrett Green has, and see how he fits into the offense that they clearly want to run, and they're not going to change, um, and tweak it around him instead of trying to force something that just hasn't worked for the past three years. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And maybe, I mean, anyone who's ever coached at any level knows every kid has different buttons that you can press. Like some people need a lot of praise. Some people need some tough love. Like that's how you get the best out of them. So who knows if Neil Brown's just, you know, sees a guy who seems very confident and can lead a room and knows that he needs some tough love. I don't know, but it, it's just been so consistent lately 
um, with the way last season ended and now the spring game. Uh, the comments are just odd to me. I don't know how else to put it. All right. Well, if you guys don't have any more comments on the quarterbacks, let's go to the running back room. It seems like WVU has four proven halfbacks with CJ Donaldson, Tony Mathis, Johnson, and Anderson in the room, but they could even potentially have a fifth guy with Jaheim White. White ran for 91 yards on seven carries and even had a long 53 yarder on Saturday. Um, again, it was only a scrimmage, but he did look very explosive. He passed the eye test for me, at least. Um, has this been the deepest running back room WVU has ever had? Clark, what do you think? The deepest they've ever had? Now that, I'm not sure. Deepest I can remember? Hell yeah. I can't ever remember a time when we had four guys, you know, that were capable of starting. I mean, we had a point back here in 2016. I mean, we had like Rochelle, Rachel Shell, we had Petaway, McCoy, but I mean, none of them were, you know, didn't have the talent that, you know, we have now. Because I mean, Donaldson, he's prone to have a breakout season. I mean, he kind of had one last year, but that guy's, that guy's ready to pop off. Like he's ready to go. Um, and Anderson, Anderson's really impressive. I mean, that guy barely got a carry all year, came in and pop 250 yarders against Oklahoma State. I mean, I'm just I, I can never remember having a running back room that was just so capable, like every single player capable of big play potential, capable of, you know, being a every down back. I mean I mean I I know that it, it might seem crowded, but I mean, we don't have many receivers on the outside, so we're gonna need the, every single one of these guys. Cause I expect us, we're probably gonna pass not pass, we're gonna run the ball quite a damn bit this year so you know just having those bodies in the room and the talent in the room i mean it's it's huge and i i think that's a big reason why i expect us to be a surprise this year i expect us to be a force on the ground yeah yeah i mean i definitely agree with that i i in terms of starting materials that's running backs that's a great point because you know i'm thinking back that you know we that we had the year where we had um slayton and divine um but i mean for starting quality guys um i'm really hard pressed to think of anyone um that can match up now in terms of maybe total talent um you know maybe that slate and divine backfield tops it just because uh the star power that they had but we have four guys like you said that are capable of starting and producing every game um and i'm not sure which one i like best i mean i, I definitely think that Tony Mathis is right now probably seems like he's at the bottom of the list for me. Unfortunately, I think he had a solid spring game, but you know, those other three guys plus Jaheim white, um, they bring so much more to the table. And um, the one thing that I still worry about, you know, kind of in the back of my mind is, you know, how do we ensure that we keep a hold of all of these guys? Because with the transfer portal, I feel like, you know, someone's going to be barking at their door saying, Hey, why split carries four ways when you can get 60% of the work here? Um, is that yeah. going to happen? I really hope not, but we'll that's see. what I wanted to ask you guys. I mean, this is a good problem to have, obviously, but as you know, there's only one football to go around. So do you guys think a running back might hit this latest transfer portal? Cause we're, we're in it right now. It currently ends on April 30th. So any day now someone could announce, Hey, I'm entering the portal. It seems like they all get along. I mean, if you see the videos after the game, they're all hugging each other. So it is a tight knit locker room. But do you guys think that, you know, going into the fall, we're going to have all five of these guys who we think are capable of playing? I don't. I think, I think <laughs> they'll stay. I mean, I think they'll stay through this season. I mean, I don't think they're going to jump ship before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a good chance white gets red shirted. As you guys mentioned though, we're a little short at wide receiver. I mean, maybe they find ways to get them involved in the passing game, but I think most likely um, if all four stay and I kind of have a feeling they will, at least for this season, I think white uh, might play in a few games, but they're probably going to try to save a year of eligibility. Um, but we'll see. I mean, we still have a few days to see how this all shakes out. I, I really feel like, this, there's no inside information here. This is just complete speculation. Um, I really feel like one of Johnson or Anderson will probably end up transferring just because they're in the same class. Um, 
you know, they're going to be competing for the longest amount of time against each other. And, you know, just thinking through it, you know, like you said, there's only one ball and I'm sure one of them is going to want to be the guy eventually. Um, and it's really hard whenever you're in the same class. I mean, cause they're just going to overlap the entire time they're here. Um, mm-hmm. I really hope we keep them both, but I feel like one of those two is probably the most likely. Cause I feel like, you know, Tony Mathis, he's been around enough. And even if he doesn't get carries, you know, he's a leader and I feel like he'll be there to support the guys and fill whatever role we need him to. Um, the other two guys are young enough that they can take off and kind of start their own legacy somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, just to kind of put like a final note on the running back room, I thought it was very encouraging to see CJ Donaldson out there and you know, just the way he was moving around. He seems to be nearly fully healed. healed. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm sure he's not 100% back, but that was a nasty knee injury he had this past fall. And I was honestly a little shocked that they were willing to put him out there as much as they did and take contact. But uh, the guy's a trooper. I mean, he, he's a true gamer. He, he's, he's like an old school guy. I know people said that a lot last year with his running style, but uh, this guy's mentality really is a throwback. Yeah, I loved it. He looked strong, and that was amazing. And yeah. also, remember, we're going to have a six body in there, uh, DJ Oliver. We got him in the, this class. That's um, right. I forgot about that. Yeah, he he's has a big a, guy, too. I don't think he was an early enrollee, but he's a, he's a big dude. I mean, he's a, he's a big dude. And, I mean, I, obviously, I've watched some of his tape. I mean, you know, you know, just never know how high school is going to translate to college. But, I mean – that's another body in there. That room's crowded. He's 100%. like a bowling ball. What is he like? 5'10", 230 pounds or something? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, for all the gripe we give uh, <laughs> Neil Brown, he does know how to bring in talent. I'll give him that. Uh, but switching gears a little bit, a big question for the 2023 season is West Virginia's w- wide receiver room. Um, on Saturday, Devin Carter seems to be the deep threat that he was advertised to be when he came here. He had three catches for 77 yards with a long of 54. And again, um, you know, he did play WVU's weak secondary in a scrimmage. So let's try to keep expectations pretty reasonable. Um, but, it, you know, did his performance give you confidence heading into the season? Because I, I liked what I saw from him. I liked um I, I liked the the top guys. You know, I think Braham, Aaron, even though he only had the one catch, um, and Carter all looked solid to me. Um, I think my big problem is is that I really didn't see one guy who and it's still early um, who seems to kind of be the guy, the playmaker, the go-to guy that we need. Um, You know, if we want to loop him in here, the one guy that I was really impressed with that maybe, you know, could maybe be kind of the, at least the, the reliable third down weapon is Cole Taylor. Mm -hmm. Um, I felt like his catches were really, really amazing. And um, he gives us an element at tight end that we haven't had in, I can't remember when. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to talk about him, too. He had three catches for 36 yards, which, you know, that doesn't jump off the stat sheet. But his memorable moment was he made a very impressive one-handed catch over the middle. And he's just a big body. And I I can't tell you how many times we said, we got a big body tight end. Is this the year they're finally going to utilize a tight end? Um, I I feel like this guy could be it. But like I said, we've said that about guys multiple times in the past. I really hope with these younger quarterbacks, whether it's Green, whether it's Nico, guys who don't have a ton of experience, um, hopefully Cole Taylor can be that comfort blanket with with those younger guys. Um, Clark, what do you think about our wide receiver room and Cole Taylor? Are you are you feeling confident? Uh, the wide receiver room. I mean, I'm so I've been pretty much preaching we need to be 80 20. You know, run pass this year. So. Saturday didn't do a whole lot to change that. I mean, Devin Carter looked good. He, his routes were great. I mean, he contests the ball. He makes good catches. Cole Taylor's going to be a good check down for any, you know, whatever quarterback's back there. Um, we just don't have talent in that room right now. Uh, Cortez Brahim looks shifty, but we got to see that in a real game. You know what I mean? No, that was just spring game. We got to see that in a real game. Um, I don't know. I, I still feel like we need some help in that room. Yeah, uh, we got it. We actually got it today. Jalen Jalen Ellis from Baylor uh, committed to us. Um, 
but I still we still need we need another I'm not gonna say a big name. We need another deep threat. Like I mean we got Devin Carter. I like to have at least two guys on in the wide receiver room that can go deep at any time. You know, just kind of keep the, the secondary on their toes. But as far as confidence, I mean I'm gonna have to see it in a real game. I mean because, like you said, our secondary is our secondary. It's not, it's not, uh, not the you know world beaters, you know that they were under Tony Gibson for a couple of years. Um, yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, and let's talk about Jalen Ellis because that just broke a couple hours ago. He's a six foot three, one hundred eighty four pound wide receiver who will have two years of eligibility left. Um, not a ton of production while he was at Baylor. He. This is just last season, but he only had three catches for 154 yards and a touchdown. Now, that was all in one game against Texas. Um, but, I mean, like we said, the, the the stat lines don't really jump off the page. So how do you guys feel about that pickup? I think it's solid. Um, you know, the one thing I, I kind of differ a little bit from Clark, Clark on, on his opinion with the, the deep threat guys, I, I feel like, you know, Ellis is is one of those deep threat guys, but I feel like we have a lot of those right now. Um, we have Jeremiah Aaron, um, now Ellis. We have Poke from Kent State, who is another speedster. Um, Devin Carter seems to be a deep threat. Um, you know, the one guy that I'm really, uh, you know, the role that I feel like is wide open that maybe Ellis can do just because we don't have enough tape on him is, you know, that slot role. It's just someone who's reliable, can hit those short routes, um, you know, can kind of hit the soft spots of the zone. I'm thinking of like a Winston Wright or a Dekeel Shorts or even Sam James towards the end of last year who really made a difference in the slot. Um, that's something that I feel like has always been a strength at WVU, and that's a big hole. Um, that I'm not sure who's going to fill it. I mean, maybe it's Jeremiah Aaron, but, um, you know, he played a little bit, you know, all over the place come Saturday, uh, on Saturday. So, um, you know, it's good to have talent. And I feel like Ellis has the pedigree, um, but you know, is the talent there to to break the the two deep? Because um, right now, I feel like we have a lot of solid talent, but we only have maybe two or three guys who are you know borderline starter quality talent. Yeah, yeah, I 100% agree with you. Clark even mentioned it. I think we still need to pick up one more wide receiver for me to feel pretty confident. Because as everyone keeps saying, it, it is going to be a run heavy team it's not going to be like uh spread it out and throw it all over the field so i think you can get by with these guys um especially if you add one more guy who can really solidify that locker room but um you know as of right now i'll, I'll put it this way i feel a lot more confident in our locker room now than i did say two months ago before we got carter before we got ellis and uh i feel like it's starting to come together a little bit although there's still no one in that room that really jumps out to me I feel like they're guys who um, can at least be competent. Yeah, I feel like what we're really missing is a, you know, about a six foot four, 210, 215 pound kid, you know, maybe from the Maryland area, um, area, you know, maybe runs about a four or five. I, I don't know um, if any of those have ever been on the roster um, that may have left in the past 12 months, but that feels like someone we could really use right now. Yeah, honestly, if Caden Prather was still here, this would honestly be a, a solid room That's, yeah. it just took me a couple of seconds i had to connect the dots i'm like he's pretty damn specific right now like <laughs> I, i'm the biggest caden prather fan of all time so um i tr try to sprinkle it in every episode that we have <laughs> so um another interesting story that came out from the spring game was um you know, Jimmy Bell, after, after playing center for the Mountaineers this past season, he's playing right tackle for the Mountaineer football team this spring, and he hasn't played football in his collegiate career. However, he did play all through high school. He played through the lower levels. So he does understand the game, which is a, you know, a big step making this jump. Um, and he certainly has the build for it. He's six foot 10, 285 pounds. But the spring game was only his sixth practice so far. Um, so in your guys' opinion, is this a move that's really going to work for Jimmy Bell and the Mountaineer football team? Or is this just a fun story to talk about in the offseason? I think Neil Brown needs to make it work because we could really use that extra scholarship on the basketball team. Um, but in all, in all seriousness, um, 
I felt like he did a good job run blocking. He wasn't great pass blocking, but it felt like he was moving guys out there. Um, I think, was he out there when uh, Jaheim White had that big touchdown run? I feel like he was on the play at least maybe right before that, but um, I know he was out there off and on. Um, But, you know, the one thing I was a little disappointed in that, you know, we didn't get to see him do any reps at tight end because I know Neil mentioned that he was going to play him at tackle and tight end. And I just think it would be fun to have a six foot 10, 280 pound tight end out there um at least in the red zone but um i mean he, he he was being recruited when he was in high school um before he switched permanently to basketball um for football so um I, I feel like he has there's something there but he's just so far removed from um that life i guess that um it's gonna be tough to you know get that back um un- unfortunately you know for him you know i wonder if his best opportunity for, you know, making a career for himself is on the football field. Cause right now I feel like, you know, the basketball team with Jesse Edwards, which we'll talk about here in a little bit and James Okonkwu and Waggy, um, you know, all three of those guys, I feel like are better than him on the basketball team. So if he would go back to basketball and stick there, what's his minutes going to be like, even though he did start all 34 games last year, you know, I feel like his role is just gone on the basketball team right now. Yeah. Clark, weigh in. How do you feel about it? I'm indifferent. Uh, it's a, it's in a story that really piqued my interest. I'm not going to lie. Uh, even if he does play football, I mean, there's so a lot of our offensive line is pretty set in stone. I just don't see him playing a whole lot. I mean, I don't know. This it seems more like a, publicity thing than anything to me i mean i'm probably just you know, talking out of my ass right now i mean but i i don't know it's just i saw it and i'm like eh, oh well you know i i really don't have an opinion on it honestly yeah i mean looking at it he, he obviously had some gaps in his game which is expected he had the only penalty of the entire game he had a holding call again kind of expected but um to, to kind of put a positive spin on all of this, he does have two years of eligibility left because it is kind of hard to see him having a huge impact this season with him coming over this late. Um, maybe he'll get plugged in here and there, but even that's kind of unlikely. However, if he does stick with football, I could see him potentially, you know, having an impact a year and a half from now because he does have the build. He does have the background to already know a lot of the knowledge of the game. So um, down the road, I could see this playing a big impact, but right now, probably not. I will say I don't mind the extra body out there on the offensive line. Um, Typically, you know, injuries on the offensive line will pop up here and there, so I don't mind having him there. Um, I forget what day exactly it is, but I know Neil Brown and Coach Huggins are going to meet very soon and discuss Jimmy Bell, discuss his role on each team. And uh, we're probably going to get a clear picture of his future here in the next couple of days. Yeah. You know, just to kind of put a bow on it from my perspective, you know, I feel like this is something that, you know, coach Huggins maybe through Ren break Baker kind of um, encouraged Jimmy Bell to do and tried to give the opportunity and then have the opportunity kind of, like I said, to, to get Jimmy Bell on scholarship for the football team, because if he would play football and basketball, his scholarship would actually count towards the football team. Um, because that's the way there's like a hierarchy of things. Um, so I, I think that's kind of what Bob's trying to do is maybe, you know, we keep him on the basketball team just as a body. Um, cause we like Jimmy, but you know, if he could play football too, that'd be great. But, you know, on the second piece of it, you know, in the year and a half uh, time frame that you talked about Tyler, um, you know, who knows what could happen because he is a really good athlete. And, you know, I feel like in the NFL way more so than the NBA, um, you know, I'm not saying Jimmy Bell's an NFL player, but teams look at just attributes and size and things like that. So, I mean, someone may just look at him and be like, Hey, he's big and he has some football experience practice squad and see what happens. I mean, yeah. that I think the starting, what right tackle or left, no, starting left tackle for the Eagles, he was, a what was it? A rugby player or Australian football player or something like that. Um, and he's one of the best in the league and he just kind of, you know, came over one day, got a practice squad because of size and athleticism. So anything can happen there. Um, and that might be his best bet for having a career in sports um, because the NBA is hard. 
Yeah, I'm with you. He certainly has the build for it. For it, And like you said, in the NBA, his type of build and style is kind of a dying breed in the NBA. You know, he's not like the big athletic stretch center, which is what you see a lot nowadays. Um, he's kind of like that old school, get under the rim, grab rebounds, put up a shot here and there, which, um, you know, like we said, you don't see a lot in the pros. So I agree with you. His best shot at a pro career is probably football so um rooting for the kid let's move on to the new ncaa rule changes for football um sports are always trying to shorten the length of games we we see it in major league baseball with this pitch clock and there's countless other examples of pro sports doing this well college football just changed three rules and it's definitely going to make the game go by faster the first rule is the clock will not stop on a first down unless it's under two minutes in the second and fourth quarter, I, I can, that's fine by me. I don't think that's a, a huge deal for fans watching the game. The second is teams can no longer call back-to-back timeouts. It's not like you saw this a lot, but teams did do this to ice kickers towards the end of the first half or towards the end of a game. And the third rule is there is no untimed downs at the end of the first and third quarters. So if there's a penalty at the end of those quarters and it's the final play, It'll just carry over to the first play of the second or fourth quarter. So, um, you know, I'll let you guys start. Do you love these changes? Do you hate them? Are you indifferent? Clark, how do you feel about those three rule changes? At first, when I first heard about them, I I hated it because, like, I thought the first down, like, the clock stopping after a first down was unique to college football. And, like, I just – I've always liked it. Um, But the more I think about it, the more I'm like, you know, especially in a game – like Towson last year, like, you know, ready to hit the road. I'm like, man, this thing needs to hurry up a little bit. So it'll be good. It'll be good there uh, in blowouts, um, shortening the game. Uh, the back-to-back timeouts, not a big fan of that one, uh, especially for the ice kicker situation. Um, you know, I don't know. I guess I would fall under the indifferent. I know it sounds like I don't care a lot, like, what we're talking about tonight, but uh, – I, I'm indifferent. I mean, it, it'll there's subtle changes, and I mean, they they might be noticeable. They might might not be noticeable, you know. Once we get to watching, um, but the one the one I really paid the most attention to was definitely the first down clock. I kind of wish they would have left that one alone, but I guess we'll we'll see what happens. So, uh, you know, I I think this affects more than just college football, and um, I'm very disappointed. Uh, I feel like that this is a uh, ploy by EA Sports to just make it so that they can just rewrap Madden in, as the <laughs> new um, NCAA football game. And it's going to be extremely disappointing. It's going to break my heart because I've been waiting years for that to come out. Um, Tyler and I still both play NCAA 14 quite a bit. And if the new NCAA game is just a rewrap of Madden um, with all the same rules now, basically, as the NFL Basically, that's what they can do with the college football game. It's going to be terrible. But um, in, I guess, context of this podcast, talking about the effect that's going to have on the game, um, you know, it's whatever. I mean, if they wanted to really shorten the games, truly, they would cut down on commercials, but that's where they make their money. Yeah, um, I do like the first happened. down. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I do think that the one that pains me the most is definitely the no stoppages on first downs that's just something that i always liked as about college um i felt like it gave you know a little bit of an advantage at least to the to the offense there and um you know made it a little bit more strategic in terms of you know you don't always have to go for the big play all you have to do is get a first down sometimes it's better just to go up there on you know with four minutes left in the second quarter um, and you're trying to score instead of trying to pass the ball and hurry up, you can just run a QB sneak, get the first down clock stops, get things going again. And I felt like that was unique to college football and it made it special. Um, I mean, it's not the end of the world. I'm still going to watch, I'm still going to enjoy it. So, um, just a little disappointed, but, um, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Yeah. Guys, I, I think the first down clock, it really just depends on which end you're looking at it. I mean, like, if we're in a we're up three and the other team has the ball with thirty seconds left, we're going to love that first down rule. Like, oh yeah, they're not they're not going to have any more you know any extra time to do anything. We're going to love it. But we're down three, we're moving the ball. We're going to be like, damn, I wish they wouldn't uh wish they wouldn't have changed that rule. Sure, 
Yeah, yeah, I think yeah this, absolutely. This is just a ploy by all of our wives to get us home earlier on Saturday. And so <laughs> <laughs> I'm a single man, so I'm okay with that. No, oh, so you're fine with no wonder you're indifferent. So um <laughs> uh I'm kind of with you guys. Like, I don't hate it. It's it's fine. But um, I, I, I don't like that sports are trying to shorten everything. Baseball, I kind of get because if it's a slower game and they're trying to get younger interest. I don't understand why they're trying to hurry up football all the time. Like, is anyone really complaining how long a football game is? Like, most of the people who watch football sit there and enjoy every minute of it. And when it's over, you're kind of sitting around going – man, is there another game on? I kind of want to watch more football. So I, I don't understand why they're trying to get us in and out so quick. Um, the rules are fine. The back-to-back timeouts are annoying. So I'm fine that they got rid of that. The, um, you know, untimed down, I'm fine with that. I mean, how often does that happen? I did like that the clock stopped on first down in NCAA. It did make it unique. And it also allowed for comebacks more which we love in college football. It's fun to just flip on a random game and see a a big, you know, two score comeback with just a few minutes left, which um, obviously, like we said, if it's under two minutes, it'll still stop. But say you're down 17 points with five minutes left, you know, it was still possible to come back. Now that with this new rule, you're probably done so because those, those three of the first five minutes are going to be gone before you know it. So, um, I don't know. It's not that big of a deal, but I wish they would just stop trying to hurry up my football games on Saturday and Sunday. I enjoy it. I want to watch it. Quit trying to throw me out. Yeah, honestly, like if they were to, you know, if they really wanted to shorten it and I know, you know, it's never going to happen, but if they wanted to cut out some commercials and leave in the rules the way they were and put ads on the jerseys or something like that, I'd be for that. You know, if that's how they made up the lost revenue or put more ads on the stadium or, whatever you know um put it at the bottom or split screen it or something yeah i I don't mind the split screen ones especially when they're just like all standing around there like picking their pants you know whatever split screen ad um i just want to watch the game like you know every you know distraction um and cutaway is so annoying especially like when you're in the stadium and you know, you have that guy in the red shirt holding that stupid clock down there. And you the most hated man, guy. the most hated man in the entire stadium is, and it's always some big guy. It's never like some fit dude standing out there. They always find the fattest guy, throw a red jacket on him, and he stands out in the middle of the field. I mean, there's enough like entertainers and dancers in the world. Why don't they like, get someone out there who can like do some tricks with that pole, spin it around, dance? I don't know, just do something entertaining. Um, make my time, you know, feel more valued. There I feel so bad for that guy with the clock, though. I feel I hear him get booed so much, and I'm like, oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's poor guy. Well, he deserves to do his job. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about basketball. West Virginia basketball has been staying busy this off season by adding big name transfers. First, they landed point guard Chris Carissa. And then their latest addition is the six foot eleven center Jesse Edwards, and Edwards only has one year of eligibility remaining. But this guy's going to make an immediate impact. Just last season alone, he averaged fourteen points while shooting fifty nine percent. He averaged ten rebounds and two blocks per game. And you know, if you put those stats right next to some of the WVU big men in the past, like Devin Williams, Kanate, Derek Culver. I mean, his stats are right there with those guys. And all of those guys were beloved when they were here. So I don't see any reason why Jesse Edwards isn't going to make a huge impact just like those three did. So how do you guys feel about picking them up? And uh, do you think we finally got that rim protector, that scoring threat inside that we've been missing these past few seasons? I think so. I mean, I'm really excited about him. I think he's going to be great. And I think he's everything that Bob Huggins has wanted as a center and just hasn't had in the past several years. Um, the, my only concern with him is, you know, we all know Syracuse. We know Bay Bayheim, um, what he loved to do, the two, three zone and, you know, how that can inflate some of those block numbers. Um, is he going to come here and block uh, average over two blocks a game? I don't think so. 
Um, but you know, I still think he'll be up over, you know, a block, block and a half, which is fine. Um, I still think he's good defensively. I do think it's going to be in a little bit of an adjustment for him to come in and play more man to man. I don't think Bob Huggins is going to run primarily two, three zone anytime soon. Um, but other than that, I mean, I think it's a home run, um, tremendous pickup by Huggins and team. Yeah. Clark, how do you feel about the pickup? Uh, I'm all for it. Um, I mean, I'll be honest with you guys. I, I've never been the biggest basketball fan. So some of the basketball terminology you guys use, I'm kind of like lacking, but I mean, uh, you know, if we can, we can stack this roster, let's go for it. I mean, it seems like every time I'm logging on Twitter here lately, we're getting somebody else. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. they're coming from big universities. So they were, you know, obviously pretty, pretty daggone good coming out of high school. So I'm all for it. You know, I love it. And I think that's one thing. That's a great point, Clark, because, you know, Huggins is just kind of starting to dip his toe into this transfer portal thing. And, you know, even whenever he was getting guys out of some of these smaller schools like Malik Curry, you know, they were good, at least in, in spurts. Um, so he knows how to identify talent, which you know, is obvious because he has so many wins. But, you know, at the same time, now he's being able to pull these guys from power five schools um, who have tremendous success playing and producing at those levels. So not only are you getting guys that Bob Huggins have, they have the Bob Huggins stamp of approval on them, knowing that they can play basketball, but they're doing it already against power five conferences for some pretty solid programs. So um, I, I don't even know. I mean, these guys could be tremendous and this team could be leaps and bounds better than last year when we were winning with guys who other than I think Emmett Matthews played for smaller schools. Yeah. The other thing is um, Jesse Edwards was supposed to visit Kansas, Gonzaga, like powerhouse schools. And he came to Morgan Morgan. and and committed before he even left and never visited a Kansas or a Gonzaga. So, I mean, that makes me even more excited because that means Bob Huggins, his staff, um, Jay, all those guys who have been getting a lot of praise lately for pulling these guys in are really doing their job. And it's, I mean, they're still pulling guys in. They still have another scholarship spot to fill. So it's exciting that that they're actually pulling all this talent in. And hopefully it all comes together for a magical run next year. Yeah, and just just for comparison, too, I think it's important to, like, look back at the guys we got last year and who we made the tournament with. I mean, Eric Stevenson played for South Carolina, but he was only, like, a 10-point-per-game guy. Terrible, you know, his shooting numbers weren't great. Um, Emmett Matthews was okay for... Washington, you know, shooting numbers weren't great there either. Um, you know, and you had Joe Toussaint who, you know, I don't even think he averaged like eight points a game there. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like this is a huge upgrade. We have number ones from quality college basketball teams as opposed to second or third or fourth options from like we had last year, um, which is really exciting. I mean, even Kirk Creesa, he, uh, his three point shooting numbers were tremendous. Um, he's a great passer. He had some huge games last year. Um, so yeah, I, I'm really excited about basketball. I'm with you. Yeah, my bad to Kirk Carissa. I called him Chris Carissa earlier. <laughs> he's uh he he was actually named after Steve Kerr, which I didn't know that until a few days ago. So uh my bad to him. I'm excited to have him as well. But uh, we mentioned there's still another scholarship spot. Another transfer WVU hopes to land is Raekwon Battle. And he was in Morgantown over the weekend. I believe he left Monday. And he could be the final piece to complete this 23-24 roster. So um, he started his career at Washington, even played with Eric Stevenson for a time. and uh, But he quickly transferred out. He went to Montana. Montana State for two years, had a monster season last year, and now he's looking for a new home again. So uh, would you guys be excited if that final roster spot was filled by the six foot five guard? I would love it, you know, and I feel like when you hear Montana State, um, you think of, oh, well, this is just another small school guy. But like you said, he went to Washington and he was a former top 100 recruit. Um, he's a tremendous athlete. He's not just someone who's a, a stat patter against bad teams. He's jumps out of the gym. He can dunk a lot. Um, he can shoot. Um, he could play solid defense, even though, you know, he wasn't asked to be the number one defender on the team last year because he was doing so much offensively, but he has the build and the skill to really do it. Um, I think he'd be the perfect fit because he gives us a little bit more size in the backcourt, which we really need. And that was, you know, 
my concern with a couple of guys they brought in before him or at least were targeting um, with K- uh, Caleb Grill, who ended up going to Missouri, um, who's only 6'3", kind of limited in his game. And then Avery Anderson, who didn't end up um, visiting, but is another one of those smaller combo guard types. Um, Battle really brings size, and his athleticism is something I think that uh, Bob Huggins would just love and would really add an X factor to this team. I'm with you. He he averaged 17 points a game last year, almost, I mean, 47% from the field. That's almost up there in 50, 35 from three and 83% from the free throw line. So a solid free throw shooter too. And I believe he played, was it Kansas state in the first round? It was a big 12 team. And yeah, although his team, yeah, although his team lost, he scored a lot. So, I mean, that just proves he can score against, um, you know, the competition that we're going to be seeing next season. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, another thing we wanted to talk about real quick is former WVU forward, Fairmont State native, Jalen Bridges has announced he's exploring the NBA draft process. Uh, this means Jalen could still return to Baylor if he decides there's there's not a lot of interest from NBA scouts. Um, and we've seen other players do this in the past, so it's not that unusual to see. But Brandon, what are your thoughts on the former Mountaineer making this announcement? I think it makes sense for him to do it. I mean, I, I definitely think his season at Baylor was underwhelming um, compared to kind of what he sold as the reason for leaving WVU. I feel like he did exactly the same thing at Baylor as he did at WVU. I know he's finished the season strong. He had some really nice showings um, in the last few games of the season. But, you know, what? what's really going to, and I'm hoping he gets this as his draft evaluation feedback is he really needs to apply himself more. And I feel like with all the players who are leaving Baylor after this past season, um, he's going to be asked with doing a lot more. And this is really going to be the last, I mean, it's not going to necessarily be the last year, but it's going to be, you know, the biggest opportunity for him to really show if he is that type of guy that can play in the NBA and really kind of show that he has scoring chops that he can take initiative in scoring that he can create his own shot that he can attack the rim. Um, all these other things that as WVU fans, we saw and complained about him, um, for not doing, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like it makes sense, but, um, I'm really hoping that he gets constructive feedback and he actually takes it to heart as opposed to the way that when he got constructive feedback here at WVU, the way he handled it, which was he kind of ran away from it. Yeah, I mean, last season, 10 points per game, five rebounds, 50% shooting. Uh, pretty good, but I mean, nothing that really jumps out. Uh, I've always thought Jalen had talent to be an NBA player. Uh, he was one of my favorite players while he was on WVU's roster because he, he had so much potential and you know would show off that athleticism by doing some flashy dunks here and there and going off. But, uh, you know, again, his stats didn't really jump off the sheet for me while he was at Baylor. Good stats, good player, but nothing that leads me to believe he's going to get drafted. Um, I'm not ruling it out, but if I was a betting man, I would say probably not. There's only two rounds in the NBA draft. And as we all know, his tenure here at WVU ended messily. Um, it, it's you know, There's not a whole lot of love for Bridges in Morgantown right now, but... <laughs> The kid certainly has the build. He has the skills to make it. Um, more than likely, if he doesn't come back to Baylor, I could see him going to the G League and possibly improving well enough to make an NBA roster down the road. But I can't imagine a team drafting him as of right now. Could you? You watch the NBA more than I do. No. I mean, I think one of the biggest things for him is he really needs to, you know, hearkening back to like the – the ball brothers, you know, do what Lonzo ball did and distance himself from his dad, because I feel like um, Jalen Bridges, dad's Corey um, kind of lives vicariously through Jalen and really gets in his head. Um, I mean, we, we've uh, all seen the interactions that his family has with WVU fans and other people on social media. And, you know, sometimes as a player, you just need to get away from that and do things your own way because um, you can still love your family but you need to do what's best for you sometimes. And sometimes your family is doing what they think is best, but they are by no means basketball experts on how to get yourself to the next level. I mean, Jalen's dad didn't play 
in the NBA. I don't think he got anywhere close. I think he played for Fairmont state or something. So um, I hope he really gets the feedback that he needs to hear. And he takes he it to takes heart, heart and yeah. um, makes the most of it. Cause like you said, he has the athleticism, the size and everything else to make an NBA roster, but he needs to improve his game. He can't just be a six foot six spot up shooting guy who can only defend on ball. He needs to be able to move better. He needs to be more aggressive. He needs to be able to attack closeouts or um, he's going to be playing overseas. And I think that would be a waste of his talent because I do think that he has, you know, the things that you need to be to at least be a bench player in the NBA. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. Um, and the, the kind of, finish all this off Clark we'll get you back in here we want to talk about WVU baseball real quick right now they're 29 and 11 8 and 4 in Big 12 play and just this week they hopped back in the uh, top 25 rankings I saw they were ranked 18th in the latest poll number one in the Big 12 conference and they have a really really good chance to host a regional in college baseball's postseason something I believe they've only ever done twice Um, so that's exciting. I'm not going to lie. I don't follow WVU baseball as much as I do WVU football and basketball. It's just, um, a lot to keep up with, but, uh, Clark, how do you feel about, uh, WVU's baseball team right now? I'm loving it. I absolutely love it. Uh, they actually, they, they beat Penn state tonight. Last I checked, they were up 13 to 11. They were not 13 to 11, 13 to one. They were beating them pretty good. Um, so they might be thirty and eleven now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but you know, it's just good. It's good for the West Virginia brand, you know, to have another sport. You know, we can say, hey, we're pretty good in that too. You know, um, you know, I mean, it'd be great to host another regional. I know everybody. Everybody I've talked to that went to the last one just absolutely loved it up there. They said the atmosphere was electric. And I mean, if you watch videos, you you guys saw that one guy walking on top of the dugout, flipping off the umpires, didn't you? I don't think so. <laughs> Yes, it, wait, yeah, yeah. Wait. Was that last year or this season? That was that was during the regional. I think it was like 2019. I think I did see that then. Yeah. Yeah, he was up. I mean, like just seeing that atmosphere, you know, it was electric. Unfortunately, they really didn't they didn't advance. But I think it's huge. It's just huge for the university. Because I mean, like, how many people look at WVU and think, oh, they're a baseball school. They got a good baseball team. I mean, I I've, I've never done it. <laughs> I mean, so it's just nice to have another sport that we can, you know, fall back on whenever football rips our hearts out or basketball <laughs> rips our hearts out. We can be like, hey, our, bas- our baseball team's doing okay, so I won't be as depressed this week. There you go. Yeah, yeah and, I mean, we are um, starting to pump out some good MLB players. Um, man, I'm drawing a blank. Who's the guy who plays for – is it Toronto? Oh, yeah, Blue yeah. Jays. Yeah, yeah, he's a beast, and, um, you know, it is good to see that. And because he's very proud to be a Mountaineer as well. I see him post stuff and and make uh, Mountaineer references. So it is great. You're absolutely right. It's good for the brand. It's good to get our name out there and maybe pull in some other big-name baseball players. And, uh, you know, obviously as a football and basketball fan, I don't want us to be known as just a baseball school, but it's always good to have, you know, multiple sports um, excelling and really making us look like a powerhouse in the big 12. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't follow baseball at all, um, but it's exciting to see that we, you know, just the news every week, seeing, you know, that we're ending up getting ranked and things like that. Um, so yeah, I, I hope we keep it up and I might watch a couple games if, uh, you know, once it gets like regionals or playoffs or whatever it's called. Um, and then maybe that will draw me in for good. And, and we have some dudes on this team too. JJ Weatherholt. I don't know if he still is, but at one point was leading the Big Twelve in hits. Wow! So it's it's not like we're doing this with a bunch of bunch of no names. We have some good players, and Randy Maisie is un, an underrated coach in West Virginia sports history. I mean, that I mean, he's done a pretty good job. He's much better than Van Zant or whatever the hell his name was. It was before him. That guy was like you talk to anybody. That guy was awful. I've never heard a good word about that guy. But I mean, I think we need to give Maisie some more love. No, just like we need to give Izzo Brown some more love with the women's soccer. They're doing great jobs. Yeah, yeah definitely. 100%. Um, yeah, I think what may, might make me a big fan and a big follower is just to go to that stadium. Um, I've drove past it. I've never actually went in and saw a game. But um, 
everyone talks about how it's a beautiful view and uh, the atmosphere is really fun. So I just need to get down there and catch a game. And I think I'll be hooked just like I am with everything else. WVU. All right, guys. Well, if we don't got anything else, let's wrap this up. This was fun. Clark, thanks again a... for hopping on, okay. man. Um, thanks, everyone, for listening. And let us know what you think. Let us know if you agree with us, disagree with us, and we will catch you guys next time. Oh, one more thing. Um, NFL Draft is coming up this weekend. So I um, wanted to kind of get your guys' thoughts on, uh, you know, what you think uh, Bryce Ford Wheaton, Dante Stills, you think they're going to get drafted? So I, I do think Bryce Ford Wheaton's going to get picked up. Obviously, I don't think it's going to be in the first three rounds. Um, but I do believe someone's going to take a chance on him late. Um, Stills, I'm not sure. I, I could see him getting picked up in like the sixth, seventh round. I could also see him getting signed very quickly as an undrafted free agent. So um, if I had to pick one of the two, I'm going to say someone's going to take a chance on Bryce Ford Wheaton just because he scored so high in the combine. Yeah. I agree with you there. I was actually you took the words out of my mouth. I could see I could see Ford Wheaton going in the sixth or seventh round. I I don't think Dante has the size to get picked up in the draft. I think that might hurt him. I uh I watched this guy on uh YouTube, Brett Coleman, and he does all these um draft analysis and breakdowns per position and he did an episode yesterday on edge rushers, and that's actually the category he included uh Dante Stills in and he says what he thought Dante might be best at where he might excel most at is if he shed like 10 pounds and became like an outside linebacker uh, because he said he liked the reps he had there as opposed to playing inside. Um, so, you know, who knows? I thought it was pretty cool that he included him in his tier four out of the five tiers that he does for edge rushers, um, which I wasn't expected to see, see him there. So um, I hope they both get picked up by someone and, uh, you know, we get to see him play in the NFL a little bit. I mean, we don't get to see it as often as we used to, and it's always fun um, tuning in to see a mountain, former Mountaineer on the football field on Sundays. And, guys, also keep in mind, I mean, this, they don't, they don't, it's just not just the NFL anymore. They could go to the XFL. That's USFL. right. I mean, they, they're going to make a league. I mean, I think every single guy, even Jazeer Cox, the linebacker, he's going to make a league. Like, it, yeah. I just – I'm not sold on all of them making the NFL. I mean, I think Ford Wheaton has the best chance just because of his measurements and scores at the combine. Um, but, I mean, I think next spring we'll be seeing some of them in the XFL and the USFL. I still haven't caught an XFL or USFL game, but I've always meant to. I just never know when they're on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll catch stuff here and there, but for the most part, I'm seeing highlights on social media. I've only caught, like, little clips here and there on live TV. Cause they, they definitely don't promote very well, but no. uh, I'm with you guys. I want to see some more WVU guys in the NFL because that used to always be my last pick in fantasy. It was just some random mountaineer. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, I want to see them playing on Sundays, but uh, that's it for us guys. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. Thanks everyone. All right. Thanks guys for having me.